breaks into the United Nations. International attention focuses on the New York headquarters of the World Organization as the 11-member Security Council convenes to hear Soviet charges that aggressive acts by the United States menace world peace. Foreign Minister Andre Gromyko announced in advance he would ask the United Nations to condemn the incursions of United States aircraft into other states. American Representative Henry Cabot Lodge was ready with a detailed rebuttal and a plea for the President's open sky plan. As the Council voted whether to include the Soviet charge on its agenda, Ambassador Lodge delivered an effective explanation of why America voted in favor. The United States does so in spite of the fact that the current item is aimed at us and in spite of the fact that the charges involved in it are fallacious. Uh, we welcome the chance to state our own case. Another reason for our attitude, and it may be instructive for the Soviet representatives to consider this, is that we believe in free speech, even for those who differ with us. Even before the proceedings were underway, it was clear uh, Soviet Russia had no chance for the seven votes needed to carry its proposal of censure. But Gromyko, in his hour-long speech, continued the campaign of denunciation that began with the shooting down of the American reconnaissance plane over Russia that scuttled the summit and brought Russian-American relations to an ominous low point. Lodge answered Gromyko with a detailed expose of Soviet spy activities before summing up. If it should ever be accepted that the Soviet Union can maintain a double standard whereby they have thousands of spies and subversive agents everywhere while protesting one single harmless observation flight, the free world would surely be in great and peculiar danger. Torment of a nation, Chile, its southern half devastated day after day by volcanic eruptions and earth shocks of cataclysmic force which spread havoc around the entire rim of the Pacific Ocean. Thousands are dead, one quarter of the nation, over two million, homeless, and still the upheavals continue. Whole cities have been reduced to shambles. In the ruins, life goes on. Aid is pouring in, including two complete United States Army field hospitals. In a year marked by tragic earthquakes, Chile's has been felt over the greatest area by far, one of the worst earthquakes of modern times. Mountainous tidal waves triggered by the Chilean earth shocks raced across the Pacific at 500 miles an hour. Every Pacific island felt their colossal forces. On Hawaii, 6,000 miles distant, 60 are dead or missing and damage in the Hilo area may reach $60 million. Across the vast expanse of ocean, the tidal wave took a heavy toll. Along the California coast, it swept in at an angle, ripping coastal installations and causing heavy damages. Japan and Okinawa felt the impact cruelly. Their dead or missing number in the hundreds, property damage in the hundreds of millions. 1960 emerges as the most disastrous earthquake year of modern times, with more than 18,000 lives lost and the year not halfway out. The Navy's newest nuclear submarine, the Thresher, is launched at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. The 278-foot craft is the first of a new class of attack subs designed to operate deeper and more silently than previous undersea craft. The Thresher will have a crew of eight officers and 80 enlisted men. She gets a bow first launching, the first in 40 years, with the christening done by Mrs. Frederick B. Water, wife of the 8th Naval District Commandant. The Thresher's novel moving torpedo tubes mounted amidships necessitate the bow first launching. They'll make the craft one of the most effective fighters in the Navy's undersea fleet. Polaris missiles arrive at Cape Canaveral for their first test firings from the nuclear submarine expressly designed for the job, USS George Washington. 
The tests are a stirring climax to a four-year program to mate the nuclear submarine and the intermediate-range ballistic missile. Now the sub's missile hatches are cleared and ready. They'll house the 28-foot two-stage rockets until the moment when mighty gusts of compressed air will shoot the Polaris from under the sea to the surface and ignition. Every stage of the loading and the cruise to the firing area about 30 miles off Cape Canaveral is under detailed scrutiny of a battery of test instruments. The George Washington goes down some 50 to 60 feet below the surface and the time for launching is at hand. After a startling off-angle emergence, corrects itself and soars downrange 1,100 miles to its target with remarkable accuracy. A few hours later, the second Polaris is fired. Another successful shot, an achievement of major strategic importance for America's defense. As the GOP convenes in Chicago, Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York dominates the scene in the early hours, although declaredly not a candidate for either the presidential or vice presidential nominations. His proposals for the Republican platform, agreed to by Vice President Nixon, touched off a storm of controversy. Mr. Nixon's overwhelming position as the GOP favorite was unshaken, but interest in the convention was roused beyond early expectations. As the convention got underway, there seemed no doubt that Richard Nixon would be the standard bearer of the grand old party. But the contest for the position of his running mate seemed wide open, perhaps to be significantly influenced by the argument over the party platform, which threatened to carry to the floor of the convention itself. The 27th Republican convention, the foregone conclusion in its chief item of business, generates true national excitement, giving promise of one of the century's most electrifying presidential campaigns. Discoverer 13 roars aloft from a California launching pad. It's lucky 13, because after 17 orbital passes around the Earth, the missile's payload, a data capsule, is dropped to Earth and recovered 330 miles from Hawaii, the first man-made object ever recovered from outer space. Ceremonies in the White House mark the historic feat. Air Force Chief General Thomas White addresses the President. Within this capsule, Mr. President, are a great many telemetering equipments and other scientific devices. However, there is one other package, which is a national flag. This flag contains 50 stars. It is perhaps significant that this flag was released from orbit in outer space in the vicinity of our 49th state and recovered in the vicinity of the 50th state away. On behalf of the Secretary of the Air Force, the officers, the airmen, the civilians, and our scientific in and industrial team, I am proud, Mr. President, to present you this flag of the United States of America. Thank you, Tommy. It's a real present. Moscow, the wreckage of pilot Francis Power's U-2 reconnaissance plane, for Moscovites and foreign newsmen to see, as the Soviet launches its most belligerent anti-American propaganda barrage in recent years. The spy plane incident on the eve of the summit was seized upon by the Kremlin and blown up to proportions that startled and shocked the outside world. Khrushchev himself at the Moscow press conference loosed a furious tirade, charging America with deliberate aggression and threatening to attack any Allied bases from which U-2 jets flew over Russia. Hopes for the success of the summit talks even then grew faint. It was clear at the time that Mr. K was laying groundwork for a clash in which the actual issue would be his demands on West Berlin.
Pessimism was in the air as Khrushchev arrived in Paris. On arrival, he denounced certain influential circles, in his words, who were preventing the improvement of the international climate. It was clear that the emotional Russian premier was in an ugly mood. President Eisenhower arrived, amply forewarned by Mr. K's bellicose pronouncements and prepared for heavy going. Ike was unsmiling, and in his airport address, troubled but not without hope. The hopes of humanity call on the four of us to purge our minds of prejudice and our hearts of rancor. Far too much is at stake to indulge in profitless bickering. Then, Khrushchev deliberately torpedoed the first meeting with an insulting tirade directed at President Eisenhower personally. He withdrew his invitation to the President to visit the Soviet Union and demanded a public apology for the U-2 spy flights. Ike disclosed future U-2 flights had been cancelled, but the summit talks seemed on the verge of collapse. In a few brief hours, Khrushchev had brought Soviet-American relations to their lowest point since Stalin at his worst. This passenger vessel lies on the waves, awaiting her christening. 1,035 feet in length, the $60 million craft will carry 2,000 passengers in air-conditioned splendor. The luxury liner is hailed by President de Gaulle as one of the great successes of French technique. Then the vessel, which it is hoped will bring renewed eminence to the French merchant marine, is christened by Madame de Gaulle with the proud name SS France. Entry on the North Atlantic Blue Ribbon Run, arena of maritime prestige. Twenty-five years ago, Machisti Battalion staged a chemical warfare field day outside Rome, complete with poison gas. A cocky, confident Mussolini proudly viewed the aggressive power that he was soon to hurl against Ethiopia. In Washington, thousands of farmers massed before the White House in support of FDR's New Deal Agricultural Adjustment Program at the beginning of its third year. The AAA was under fire from conservative critics. An even hotter domestic controversy was growing as Vice President Carter, acting as President of the Senate, signed the Patman Bonus Bill to go to the President for signature or for veto of the veterans' measure. President Roosevelt made an unprecedented appearance before a joint session of Congress to defend his veto of the bonus bill. But despite his plea, the House overrode the veto with a 322 to 98 vote, spurred on by such foes of FDR as Louisiana's Kingfish, Huey Long. And Father Coughlin, a radio priest, whose participation in politics and secular affairs was gathering strong momentum. 18,000 were in Madison Square Garden for this Coughlin rally. The foundations of the entire New Deal program were rocked, and the NRA border strategy met hastily when the Supreme Court voided the National Recovery Act. In one of the most important high court decisions of the decade, the test case padlocking of a Brooklyn poultry firm for violations was held unconstitutional. The NRA's Blue Eagle was grounded by a sick chicken. As the administration worked top speed to salvage the recovery program, President William Green of the AFL warned of possible chaos in industry. Decoration Day. The 17 then survivors of the Civil War took the review with Mayor LaGuardia. Spanish-American War vets joined guardsmen swinging up New York's Riverside Drive. At Indianapolis, it was the 25th year of the 500-mile Speedway Classic, a great event then, as now. A record crowd 25 years ago, 150,000 watched the speed demons burn up the brick oval. This was the fastest race on record, with the winner, Kelly Patillo, averaging 106 miles an hour. Not bad for 25 years ago.
deficit comes from a recession. And if we can take the proper action in the proper time, this can be the most important step we could take to prevent another recession. That is the right kind of a tax cut, both for your family budget and the national budget, resulting from a permanent basic reform and reduction in our rate structure, a creative tax cut, creating more jobs and income, and eventually more revenue. And the right time for that kind of bill, it now appears, in the absence of an economic crisis today, and if the job is to be done in a responsible way, is January 1963. Such a bill will be presented to the Congress for action next year. It will include an across the board, top to bottom cut in both corporate and personal income taxes. It will include long needed tax reform that logic and equity demand. And it will date that cut in taxes to take effect as of the start of next year, January 1963. The billions of dollars this bill will place in the hands of the consumer and our businessmen will have both immediate and permanent benefits to our economy. Every dollar released from taxation that is spent or invested will help create a new job and a new salary. And these new jobs and new salaries can create other jobs and other salaries and more customers and more growth for an expanding American economy. Instead of being permanently saddled with excess plan capacity and the budgetary deficit that is created by this means. Our goal must be full capacity and full employment and the budgetary surpluses that that kind of employment and capacity can produce. When in India do as the Indians do, before leaving the country for Pakistan, Mrs. Kennedy has a ride on an eight-foot elephant who is decked out in all of his royal trappings. The First Lady is accompanied by her sister, Princess Radziwill, on the 10-minute ride aboard Bibia, or Baby. And the Mahout explained that he and the elephant grew up together. Both are 35. Mrs. Kennedy called this one of the most delightful interludes on her visit to India. Russian harassment along air and ground access routes to Berlin has brought quick reaction from Allied forces. The 14th Armored Cavalry rolls down one of the autobahns that cuts through East Germany to Berlin in a display of our determination to use these routes as guaranteed under the Berlin Four Power Occupation Agreement. Medium tanks along with motorized machine guns, armored infantry and mortar squads make the 14th a powerful, highly mobile unit. A display such as this is more than a warning that we will brook no interference with our rights of free access to Berlin. It is a morale builder for the German population. This display is music to German ears. It symbolizes our determination to stand by the people of beleaguered Berlin. That busy little fella, the silk glamour. Patu, Dior, Ricci, all of the great names want to clothe Milady in silk. The fabric of the ages makes a comeback as silk is welcomed by Dame Fashion with open arms. Shall we dance? Skating Championships at Prague, Czechoslovakia sees a brilliant exhibition by Canada's Donald Jackson. Trailing the Czech Carol Divin into the finals, Jackson executes some fancy exercises that catapult him to the crowd. The 21-year-old Jackson dazzles the crowd of 18,000 packed into Fuchik Hall. It's a display that calls for no comment as he goes into the final fireworks that bring Canada the title. <laughs> Mrs. Barbara Ann Persley of Arcadia, California is the leading contender on the American team, but is able to do no better than fifth. The U.S. is building up a new ice skating team after the tragic air crash in Belgium last year when the entire American team was wiped out. Some of this year's skaters came out of retirement to fill the ranks.
star of the show and unanimous choice of the judges for the women's title is Yuki Dijkstra of the Netherlands. The 20-year-old Dutch girl is so far ahead of her competition that she has no trouble flashing to a brilliant victory. For the first time since 1955, the title leaves the U.S., captured by one of the most versatile skaters ever seen in competition. Hats off to the pretty Dutch champ. station nestled in the mountains at Andover, Maine, a signal is sent to a speeding satellite, an historic feat that could reshape man's future. That satellite, of course, is the Telstar, 170 pounds of complex electronic equipment that receives signals beamed from Earth, magnifies them 10 billion times, and rebroadcasts them back to Earth. Pictures, telephone calls, telegraph messages, and computer data all can be handled by the orbiting device. The Telstar receives its power from batteries that are recharged by the sapphire-coated solar cells, which in turn are activated by rays from the sun as it hurtles through space at a low point of 600 miles to a high of 3,500 miles. The Telstar is set aloft from Cape Canaveral atop a Thor Delta rocket in a joint industry government effort. The Space Administration team handles the launching for AT&T, and it's a $50 million phone call for the telephone company. Future plans call for the orbiting of 20 to 25 satellites like the Telstar. Thus, when one passes out of range of ground stations, another will be coming into position. Presently, along with the ground station in Maine, there is a receiver and transmitter in Great Britain at Cornwall and in France on the coast of Brittany. Even as Telstar is launched, the French rush to complete their installation to receive a signal that night. Now the rocket climbs far into the atmosphere and the Telstar is about to separate and orbit the Earth each two and a half hours. Starting with the sixth orbit and through the ninth, the Telstar is in range of both the U.S. and European stations, and pictures are received clearly in France, with somewhat lesser success in Britain on this first test. The signals are beamed from this 18-story dome that houses the super-sensitive horn weighing nearly 400 tons, an antenna so delicately tuned that it picks up a mere whisper of a signal from the satellite and amplifies it again billions of times for rebroadcast over cables or the air. Now comes the historic moment, a moment compared in significance with the first message sent over the telegraph. This is the first picture transmitted to outer space and received back again on Earth. Scenes of the dome at Andover are flashed across the sea, and man marks another milestone in this age of scientific miracles. So proudly it waves. What does the future hold? Well, scientists visualize a belt of tell stars encircling the globe in such a manner that transmission will be continuous around the world. Both sides of the Earth can be in immediate photographic contact, communication that could bring better understanding among men. The worst deficit comes from a recession. And if we can take the proper action in the proper time, this can be the most important step we could take to prevent another recession. That is the right kind of a tax cut, both for your family budget and the national budget, resulting from a permanent basic reform and reduction in our rate structure, a creative tax cut, creating more jobs and income, and eventually more revenue. And the right time for that kind of bill, it now appears, in the absence of an economic crisis today, and if the job is to be done in a responsible way, 
is January 1963. Such a bill will be presented to the Congress for action next year. It will include an across the board, top to bottom cut in both corporate and personal income taxes. It will include long needed tax reform that logic and equity demand. And it will date that cut in taxes to take effect as of the start of next year, January 1963. The billions of dollars this bill will place in the hands of the consumer and our businessmen will have both immediate and permanent benefits to our economy. Every dollar released from taxation that is spent or invested will help create a new job and a new salary. And these new jobs and new salaries can create other jobs and other salaries and more customers and more growth for an expanding American economy. Instead of being permanently saddled with excess plan capacity and the budgetary deficit that is created by this means, our goal must be fuller capacity and full employment and the budgetary surpluses that that kind of employment and capacity can produce. Freedom Bell in West Berlin tolls in sympathy for East Germans on the first anniversary of the Wall of Shame that holds them prisoners. It was just a year ago that authorities in Communist Germany, appalled at the numbers who were fleeing to the West, threw up the wall. East German boss Ulbricht cut worshippers from their churches, separated parents from their children. But at the same time, he unwittingly united Germany as never before. On this anniversary, wreaths are placed where people died, jumping to freedom. And at checkpoints, authorities are on the alert to prevent outbreaks among West Berliners who might seize on the anniversary to vent their wrath on East German guards. U.S. patrols check a segment of the 95-mile-long barrier. Our brief memorial services led by Mayor Willie Brandt in tribute to the scores who died seeking freedom. The slogan of the day among the West Berliners is marked on the cross, We Accuse. They march along the wall, a display of silent contempt for communist efforts to imprison their friends and relatives. At dusk, tensions erupt in a rock-throwing barrage. The police have their hands full and don't succeed in quieting the Westerners for some time. The anniversary day of the shameful war. cheered by thousands of Texans on his way to a stadium for his key speech of the trip. At Rice University, there's a crowd of 40,000 present, and Mr. Kennedy calls for backing for the U.S. space effort. He says that we cannot afford to lag if we want to be in the forefront of nations. Then to the manned spacecraft center, where the $20 billion Apollo project is in high gear. Here, the president sees mock-ups like the moon bug that is being prepared for a lunar landing, and the Gemini, a larger Mercury capsule for two men and other space vehicles. The president receives a briefing on highly classified matter and seems pleased with the progress report when he inspects the apparatus that the U.S. is making ready for further conquests of space. It was in Houston that Mr. Kennedy emphasized the need for peaceful uses of space. <laughs> Fourth and final stop is at St. Louis for an inspection of the McDonnell plant, where the Phantom II fighter bomber is built, as well as Mercury and Gemini capsules. The F-4H is a 1,600-mile-an-hour streak of lightning. The Gemini, which was developed here, will allow two men to orbit the Earth for two weeks and will be used for experiments in outer space rendezvous and docking missions. This winds up the President's first-hand look at our space program, and our progress in the race for space. (laughs) 
leather is falling into step in the fall fashion parade. Finished in an explosion of rainbow colors, leather has been styled into smocks and sheathed top skirts like this eye-stopping pair. Just the thing for a day's outing at Sterling Forest Gardens in New York. On the left, a pile line coat, and on the right, a natural pigskin. Leather to get a man in a lather. Designers have let their imaginations run riot. They've even captured a leopard to line this hooded suede. Another offbeat treatment of suede, a shift with a cardigan jacket, and the suede hat offers Milady a chance to add another feather to her cap. To enhance the classic tweed, this three-piece suit is trimmed with suede and hidden beneath the sweeping lines of the coat is a leather blouse. And here, the shift is treated with a saucy bolero jacket, all topped with a kidskin turban. The chest revealed in suede with a matching tote bang. These are the fashions aimed at women who want something different. And maybe one woman who doesn't. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. That, and I quote him, training by Soviet specialists of Cuban nationals in handling defensive armaments was by no means offensive. And that if it were otherwise, Mr. Gamico went on, the Soviet government would never become involved in rendering such assistance, unquote. That statement, all ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. United States answer to what Adlai Stevenson termed Soviet blackmail in Cuba was a quarantine of all offensive weapons being shipped from Russia to that island fortress. The U.S. threw up a steel fence prepared to stop any vessel carrying materials of war. In Cuba itself, 100,000 men were put under emergency orders as they had been during past invasion scares. The waterfront in Havana and along other parts of the coast bristled with gun emplacements as the Cuban regime waited to see what their bosses in the Kremlin were to do. Cuba became the focus of world attention. Here centered the most critical threat of global war since the surrender of Germany 17 years ago. Castro has put every able-bodied man through military training. He has even armed some as young as 12 years of age, and authorities assemble thousands in cities and villages for patriotic rallies. As in the past, these rallies are designed to whip up hate of what Castro calls Yankee imperialistic warmongers. To suggestions that a UN team inspect missile sites, Castro said that they had better come ready for combat. He went on to call President Kennedy a pirate for setting up the quarantine. The United States arrived at the decision for an arms blockade after studying reconnaissance photographs made with high-powered cameras from planes flying several miles from the Cuban coast. These cameras are described as capable of spotting a golf ball on a putting green from 40,000 feet. Literally thousands of pictures can be made on each flight by these planes, and they are studied by photo interpreters who are capable of analyzing details that an untrained eye would miss. Here, for example, is a medium-range ballistic missile base that has been labeled by these specialists. Suddenly, the veil is torn from the Russian secrets. Another photo revealed a surface-to-air missile assembly depot, a base to supply the offensive sites. 
Russian technicians ripped through heavy jungle growth to carve out airstrips for high-performance MiG-21 jets, a plane easily capable of strikes far into the United States. In the greatest display of hemisphere solidarity since World War II, the Organization of American States unanimously endorses the actions of the United States, and many pledge arms and men to the cause. The vote is 20 to nothing, with Cuba absent, commending the U.S. for its efforts to bring about the dismantling of the missile bases. The organization votes the use of armed force to carry out the resolution sponsored by Secretary of State Dean Rusk, thus uniting all of the Americas in a common cause. Meanwhile, the United States continues to reinforce its Cuban base at Guantanamo Bay, the naval depot that Castro wants the U.S. to give up. These Marines have been assigned the job of protecting the base against any Cuban threats that might arise during the present crisis. They'll be on a 24-hour alert, a first line of defense. The United States went to the UN Security Council for a resolution calling for a withdrawal of all offensive weapons from Cuba. A delegation from the island heard Utant call on both sides for a three-week freeze but the Secretary General was told that President Kennedy wants the missiles scrapped first. Valerian A. Zorin's boss, Khrushchev, proposed that the U.S. withdraw its vessels and he would stop shipments. President Kennedy's missile scrapping demand was his reply. The U.S. resolution was firm and strongly... A headliner takes over the rostrum at the National Press Club in Washington. The men who cover the Capitol scene are regaled by Alfred Hitchcock, the master of suspense, who has some comments about his latest picture. For over 30 years now, I have been indulging in the occupation of raising goose flesh domestically and in England. I have only recently completed work on the latest picture. The title is quite short, just two words. There were three, but we cut the first word <laughs> and call it simply the birds. Naturally, most of the actors in the birds are. In fact, I have employed more feathered performers than have been seen since pan dancing went out of style. The cast also includes a few men and women. After all, the picture isn't just about the birds, it's about the bees too. Mr. Hitchcock receives a citation to mark his 30 years of contribution to the world of entertainment. The Birds is his 50th movie. New honors for the man who was chilling movie audiences long before air conditioning. A Titan II missile lifts from its pad. This flight down the South Atlantic target range makes history. This is the booster that will carry the Gemini space vehicle on the nation's next manned spaceflight program. What makes this test stand as a milestone is a camera that is mounted on the second stage of the booster. It has been designed to record spectacular close-ups. As the Titan nears the fringe of space, the first stage shuts down. Now, watch. The second stage ignites, and with a mighty blast, pushes the first stage away in shattered pieces. This is what an astronaut in the Gemini will see. At 17,000 miles an hour, the second stage leaves the abandoned first stage far behind as it soars 5,000 miles downrange. The curvature of the Earth is plainly visible. Through the magic of the camera, Earthlings take their first ride into space. Before he is destined to take a giant stride into history, Colonel John H. Glenn Jr. squeezes into his spacesuit. His smiling face belies the ten postponements of his flight that have kept him grounded. This morning, the weather over Cape Canaveral and in the pickup areas is better. 
and there's an air of optimism as the colonel walks to the gantry elevator, carrying his now familiar portable air conditioner. Glenn prepares to go to the 11th deck as clocks point to 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The skies are beginning to lighten, and a cool north wind rustles across the Cape. Colonel's date with destiny comes 10 months after the Russians claimed an orbital flight by Yuri Gagarin, and less than a year after Alan Shepard blazed a suborbital trail for the U.S. This is the climax of three years of training. This is the moment when the eyes of the world turn to Cape Canaveral. The Russian orbits were in a thick fog of secrecy. The United States stands or falls in the white-hot glare of worldwide publicity. In the capsule atop the Atlas missile, the Colonel will be strapped to a contoured couch. Once in flight, the Mercury will be tilted so that the astronaut will ride backwards. The seconds tick off as his rendezvous with space approaches. The hatch cover causes a slight delay when a defective bolt is discovered. Then, millions are moved to silent prayer. Takeoff of the Atlas, blasted off by 360,000 pounds of thrust, carries the Mercury gracefully skyward. The Friendship 7, climbing rapidly out of the Earth's atmosphere, exerts a pressure of six times the force of gravity on the astronaut. Loud and clear, he reports back to Mercury Control, reading off his instruments, commenting on his reactions, all as coolly and calmly as if he was commuting on the 827. Glenn is able to control the yaw and pitch of the vehicle himself. Now comes the moment when the Mercury is turned so that Glenn will be seated facing backwards. He checks with ground control. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, turn around has started. Capsule turning around, and I could see the booster during turn around just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. Uh, Roger, seven, you have a go, at least seven orbits. Roger, understand go for at least seven orbits. Actual pictures of Glenn in the capsule will give scientists the opportunity to study his reactions as he passes over the Canary Islands, Africa, the Indian Ocean, Australia, back across the Pacific and over the United States. He speeds at 17,500 miles an hour, reaching a high point of 160 miles and a low altitude of 99 miles. Each of the three orbits takes about 90 minutes. Three times the Colonel sees the sun rise within a period of four hours and 56 minutes three times around the globe for a trip of 81,000 miles before he re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, a shield protecting the astronaut from the intense heat. The carrier Randolph is the command ship in the pickup area, but Glenn, instructed not to jettison his retro rockets, lands short of the carrier. Ground instruments indicated his heat shield was loose, and he was instructed to hold onto his rocket bank to help hold the shield in place. Right at hand, however, is the destroyer Noah, and she speeds to the capsule to take the vehicle and pilot aboard. Despite a few shaky moments among ground control personnel, Glenn is down, hale and hearty. With support cables attached, a pincer-like crane will lift the Friendship 7 aboard. of a saga. The now famous Friendship 7 is safely lashed to the deck of the destroyer and the crew prepares to help Glenn from the capsule. First they attempt to help the colonel from his complex prison through the upper exit in the mouth. They encounter difficulties and so it is decided to blow off the escape hatch cover. First glimpse of the conquering hero, Colonel John H. Glenn. He left his footprints among the stars. He has a grin as wide as the path he blazed as he rests briefly before being flown to the carrier Randolph by helicopter. He is lifted aboard in a maneuver that looks more dangerous than the flight itself.
helicopter takes him to the Randolph for a debriefing and examinations by medical men. The copter no sooner touches down on deck than Glenn gets a preview of the congratulations that are still to come. On every hand, there is jubilation. On every side, smiles and cheers. He signs over his precious log and instruments to the National Space Administration. From here, he goes to Grand Turk Island for further rest before the deluge. A deluge of honors a proud country waits to bestow on a brave man. Thank you.